Hi everyone. Looks like we're live. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so let's get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shubhra. Um, I lead the research and MD team at Central Square Foundation. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to today's um, session, which is making edX accessible at scale, bridging the digital divide. Um, as part of the education track at Chatsa 21, uh, 2021, um, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers, and I'm, you know, at a personal level, really excited to hear from each of them today. Um, please join me in welcoming our panelists for today's discussion. Um, we have with us Mr. Anwar Sadat. He's the CEO of Kerala Infrastructure and Technology for Education, established by the government to foster ICT education and infrastructural development in school education. Um, he, of course, has many accolades, but the one that I would like to share with everybody is um, that he's the first Indian to receive the International Contributions Award for his contribution to educational technology, instituted by US-based AECT in 2018. Um, thank you, sir, and welcome to the panel discussion. Um, next, we have with us Mr. Aditya Chopra. He's Senior Manager at Samagra Transforming Governance, a mission-driven governance consulting firm in India. He's leading the firm's education programs with the governments of Haryana and Himachal Pradesh, uh, where these programs are focused on improving learning outcomes for around 3 billion government school going children. Thanks, Aditya, for joining us today. Thank you um, very much. We have Ms. Dayung Lee. She's an associate partner and a co lead of the Education to Employment Practice at Dalberg. Um, she focuses on strategy and policy development, innovative finance, and monitoring evaluation and learning at Dalberg. Um, she's led a study on the impact of COVID on student learning in India with UNICEF. Um, and some of her other work includes designing a tool for private sector companies to become inclusive workplaces for women. Um, and much more recently on assessing the cost effectiveness of education interventions. Thanks a lot, Dayum, for joining us today. Um, and finally, um, and finally, we have Mr. Nishant Baghel. Uh, he leads the digital um, um, initiatives at Pratham as Director of Technology Innovations, which is leveraging advanced technologies for rural attack and creating learning opportunities for all. Um, he's overseeing programs that are spread across multiple states and have been recognized by the World Economic Forum as the only school of future from India. Thank you, Nishan, for joining um, as well today. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you so much to all of, all of you for being here, and I'm really excited mm -hmm. about um, the next sort of 15 minutes and, and having a really productive discussion. Um, but before we get started, i um, just really delighted to share that CSF is releasing the second edition of the School Education in India 2021 report today. Um, and this year's report really focuses on synthesizing the data and evidence that we have on the scale and scope of the disruption in school education caused by the pandemic. Um, and the education response to the crisis that we've seen. Um, I'll really just draw upon uh, very specific sections of the report to set the context for today's discussion. Um, you know, requesting my colleague Ratan to share the link of the report in the chat box. Um, and it's also up on our website for those of you interested to read more about it. So without wasting um, just one. Um, great. And so I think we all know that schools in India have been closed since March 2020, possibly the longest in um, around the world. And this has led to um, disruption of school education not for millions of children and a loss of learning opportunities as well. Um, so, you know, roughly 320 million children have been affected. Um, and while the primary effect has been on learning outcomes, they've, of course, been affected in many other aspects, including health and, 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 and also their lifeline opportunities in terms of income, productivity. Um, a recent study by the Azim Premji Foundation um, that targeted children in grades two to six found that nearly 82% of these children um, had lost one specific um, mathematical ability, 
and 92% had lost at least one specific ability in language. So this is quite um, enormous in terms of the, the learning loss that we're talking about. Um, as, as schools had to shut down suddenly, I think our governments, both at the center and states, did an incredible job in responding to this new situation and, and introduced various measures to support at-home learning. Um, but of course, what we've seen as a result of this is that there's been an um, outsized focus on using technology and online learning um, as part of these measures. Um, and a recent survey by UNICEF um, you know, found that teachers um, really relied uh, uh, predominantly on WhatsApp for teaching during the pandemic with 89% of teachers um, using WhatsApp for teaching. Um, and you know, traditional means of teaching like textbooks was just really down below at about 21%. Um, in fact, really excited that Dayum worked very closely on this study. So really looking forward that Dayum to hearing more about the study and having you share more insights from this study um, as we go along the discussion, right? And so really what, what it's brought out much more starkly now than ever before is the lack of access to digital infrastructure, which is really needed to leverage um, learning and online learning. Um, and a survey by Pratham last year, uh, you know, showed that while there's been a, a significant increase in smartphone ownership in India, especially in rural area, we're still looking at a more than a third of our um, children not having access to a smartphone right now. And we can all imagine, right, that there are a lot of um, inequalities in access. Um, one instance being that younger children are less likely to have access to smartphone and remote learning material than older children, right? And it's truly important as we look at the disruption um, to look at these inequalities. Um, Finally, even kind of looking at the, from like a parent's perspective, right? What is it that truly sort of inhibited their ability to support their children's learning during the pandemic? And really the top three things that stand out are all around digital access. So it's around data cost, device affordability, as well as network connectivity, right? That That's really been uh, the biggest impediments that, that, you know, households and families have faced during the pandemic. Um, and so kind of taking a step back, right? I mean, as we look at a society and, and the strides that we as a country have made in digitization and digital revolution, um, I think really important to kind of realize and understand that there is still a divide that, that exists and it is multi-dimensional, um, right? And while, while we look at digital access, you know, we need to pay attention to the urban rural divide, gender divide, um, like we've talked about other sorts of divides that exist as we try and bridge this gap um, in not just education, but also in other sectors. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, um, this is the report. There's a lot more in the report, which is, you know, please do see it. Uh, but coming back to the, to the panel and the discussion that we have for today, Right, and, and maybe just even taking a step forward and, and saying that we're all talking about just how uh, COVID has deepened the digital divide that we're seeing, especially in education. Um, and in the past, we've seen several device distribution programs being rolled out both globally with by several states in India. Unfortunately, I think a lot of the evidence around these programs is pointing to um, just the limited impact it had on student learning outcome. What COVID sort of has changed in terms of this dynamic is to say that it's made it a priority to solve for this issue right now. Um, we are going to see it's unlikely that even next year we'll be back in um, a normal school environment and we might sort of be, you know, tossing between at home learning, you know, in school. Um, and truly, in that context, it becomes just more critical um, to solve for this digital divide that we're seeing right now. And so the question is not really whether this needs to be solved for. It's more about how best to solve for it, how to design really successful programs um, that are going to be scalable and cost effective. Um, so with that, I'm really going to kick off the discussion um, and, and really looking at the next 45 minutes to to learn from our panelists the work that they're doing, how they're going about this, this issue and challenge, and how do we really think about success 
um, four programs and initiatives looking at solving this digital divide. Great. Um, so let's get started. Um, um, so my first set of questions to, to all of you is really about understanding from your respective work, uh, work right? Um, what are some innovative models and approaches that you have looked at or are introducing to solve for this access divide that we're talking about? Um, and maybe I'll begin with you, Mr. Anwar Sadat. Um, and so I, I know, you know, Kerala has been doing lots of initiatives around digital, um, sort of, uh, you know, digital initiatives even before COVID. Um, and unlike some of the previous initiatives, you know, the, the initiatives that you've introduced in the last one year have focused on truly looking at providing access to students with the intent of improving the effectiveness of online learning um, for these students. I uh, would love if you can share a, a little bit about a couple of initiatives that the Kerala government has launched and also just what the government's thinking and approach has been as, as you've introduced some of these initiatives. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Subra. In fact, now, um, uh, when the COVID uh, pandemic uh, came uh, last year, uh, normally we had to start our uh, uh, academic year on 1st June onwards. This pandemic came in March uh, in India, in 2020 March. And uh, uh, the examination, after completing certain examination, it has to stop. Then uh, we took two, three months, basically, for uh, uh, no, remote uh, broadcast mode uh, campaign and engaging children with some sort of online activity. But when the schools are about to start, it was very difficult. No, uh, we thought at least for two, three months, we should have an alternate strategy. And uh, uh, the Kerala, ha uh, we have the, uh, uh, the expertise of uh, handling digital education for the last two decades. It started here in early 2000, actually, 2000, 2001. IT is a subject. And the government has rolled out a program, high-tech school program, wherein 45,000 classroom made smart in 2019. And uh, that is from eight to 12 classes. From one to seven, it has completed by 2019 end, just before the COVID. So all eco digital ecosystem is there in place and teachers are trained. Fortunately, we had a exclusive educational channel called Victors, which works on EduSat, which has been launched in 2006. Okay, so the strategy which the government, I, I will make it very brief because of the time uh, limitation. The 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 more because since the schools are closed on the june 1st the way ahead for us was either to go for an online mode or to go an alternate mode but online you know we don't have any data on the, the internet plus device access on that but we have the channel uh victor's channel so we thought of the broadcast mode so the government have made a a, a clear direction with the program called first bill program which are three components one, it's it's not an alternate to a, a, the uh, regular classroom. It's just to bridge the academic gap for some time. Second one, all students should have access to this program. Third one, we, after the TV program, teachers should do the continuous follow-up through social media or through direct or different board. So these are where the three pillars for the program. When coming to access, providing access, no. TV is required, and uh, if it if the broadcast mode is uh, so parallel to the broadcast mode, we have the YouTube channel and uh, live uh, mobile app and live stream for the victors. No, our YouTube channel has gone to three million plus. It was earlier uh, less than fifty thousand k, so it has gone to three million. Certain classes you can see that it has gone to even five million, five, 50 lakhs views. So. In the to uh, to provide the access, I, I will uh, I, I will come to the short what we have done last year. I, uh, this year it, uh, thing is very different. But last year, see, out of seventy eight point five lakhs families in Kerala, seventy three lakh ha access to TV to TV either through cable or DTH. But the victims were available only in the cable network, which caters only sixty three percent of the population. Remaining thirty seven was left behind. So we could able to bring in all DTH operators in the country which are operating in Kerala to carry Victor. So all platform started carrying Victor's channel. So it, that, that, that is the one point. Only 7% of the total population households are left behind. Then there was a gap of 2.6 lakh students who don't have 
access either TV, mobile, or uh, internet with a la laptop with internet. And there was a there was a big campaign, especially through the local self government institutions, NGOs, and uh, to the to the government level. So instead of putting on a centralized uh, access program, the government has decentralized it. And this 2.6 lakhs went down to within one month, it has come down to one lakh. In June 1st, it was 12,000. And by June 14, the number has been reduced to zero. So either through a TV or uh, through other mobile or tablet or laptop, the access has been ensured. So it was a social, uh, so, uh, socially driven program wherein the local self-government institutions and local representatives along with the government came together to ensure that all the students have access to the digital program. This is what happened for the last year. Maybe in the next session or somewhere, I will explain what is what is the strategy right now. Or if you want, I can uh, explain that uh, as of uh, now itself. Is it okay? I cannot hear. Um, sorry. Uh, maybe, sorry, very briefly, if you want to just talk about what the strategy is. Right, this right. Year, okay. Um, so this, and... This, and if you've introduced any programs which have provided devices to students specifically yeah. would, would yeah I, 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 understand. okay i'll come to that because so, so the 2020 2021 it was more of digital classes along with this the government has started a program for uh, providing uh in, uh, in the student level laptop uh to two lakh students which with three-year warranty and all operating system and other application which are on free software which is inbuilt so the cost expected was around 15000 rupees at that time but after the tender it has gone to 18000 the model is like that the uh, bpl families th there is a uh, there is a big uh, uh, neighborhood group with uh, which works on micro credit and all called kudumbashri in kerala so the kerala state financial enterprises along with the kudumbashri it mission kite bring uh, came together and started a program called vidya shri you can you can access that website and and it the, the idea was a, a, a it was not g giving free at that time they have to contribute 500 per month for 30 months so around 15000 rupees out of which 5000 will be the subsidy okay after paying three months, that means after paying 1,500 in three months, they will get the laptop. And the initial idea was to have a two lakhs laptop, but uh, uh, the, the availability was an issue. The scheme is going on. The government is remodeling that. And around 59,000 orders were placed for this thing uh, is going on. But the government has now come up with a bigger scheme called Vidya Kiranam wherein uh, 4.7 lakh students uh, are uh, uh, government is providing laptops through a, a specific uh, chief minister's redressal relief program sort of thing and in a campaign mode by part by, by the participation of nris and uh, by captain csr program and all so this vidya Shri was an eye opener for us but I know we understand that it's, it, even if you have the money and all the facilities in place, the issue of uh, uh, availability of devices is a crucial issue. It may be for uh, five, uh, uh, six to eight months minimum. The second part is to have the internet access because the devices itself will not work. But Honorable Chief Minister himself has met all the ISPs uh, which are operating in the in the state. And first priority was given to tribal sectors. Uh, we have around 1,200 tri tribal sectors, out of which 125 was a serious issue. And uh, 200 plus colonies where uh, the existing providers were agreed to extend their uh, capacity or providing fiber. Exemptions were given to lay fiber on the forest area. So. That program is on the way of completing, ensuring access to tribal first, then it will be easier to have the uh, mainland. So, so basically, you now one side, the content component, all this part, which Kaita has earlier been focusing, then the devices part, like streams like Kudumbashri. For Vidya Kiranam, if I get time, I will explain that more with that, that data. Then providing the connectivity. So with this, this in a, in, in a, in a, in a three-pronged way, the comprehensive intention has been here uh, okay. in Kerala.
No, that's great to know. Thank you so much, sir. And and maybe I'm, Aditya, I'll move to you, right? Because you're again working with two governments, um, Himachal Pradesh and Haryana, and and they also have certain similar initiatives. And maybe just really I'm quickly understanding what is the approach these two states are taking, and almost in the context of what um, sir just talked about uh, with the Vidya Shri um, scheme, right? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, so. Let me talk about the programs in Haryana and Himachal. Uh, so Himachal actually is slightly different from a uh, device donation by the government. Uh, it is more about device donation by individuals and the public at large. So what we figured in Himachal was that we were running a very successful sort of Hargar Pathala online learning campaign. Uh, but a lot of students were not able to access either by lack of devices or by lack of internet. Uh, and so we've started a program with the government uh, for donation of devices, uh, of course, reaching out to both corporates and individuals. Uh, and the numbers are somewhere around 1 to 1.5 lakh children not having access, roughly around 20%. Uh, in Haryana, that is, we're following a different route. The, the Haryana model, of course, is a little more evolved. Uh, the state is directly better connected. Uh, and here we figured that uh, we have to get to a personalized and adaptive learning model uh, for students. And so like Anwarji was also saying, we uh, are also looking at sort of giving devices uh, from the state government side. Uh, the idea is to give devices to students, all students of uh, grade eight to 12, roughly eight to nine lakh uh, students will get individual devices. Uh, on these devices will ensure that we have personalized and adaptive learning software uh, with the relevant content. Uh, and of course, also providing data uh, internet and so forth uh, facilities, right? So broadly, these are the two programs. Uh, one thing uh, I'll highlight here. Now, uh, when we look at other programs of, of states, sort of in the past, a lot of these programs become device distribution programs, right? You give out the hardware, uh, and then it becomes difficult to track what the child is doing and who all are involved in the child's learning through this device. Right? So what we've tried to ensure is that we put so although the, the theory of change is that student agency is at the core of it, right? the student should be able to drive adaptive practice, personalized remediation, all of that. However, teacher also remains a key stakeholder uh, in, in our programs. Uh, and so just designing the program around the teaching learning cycle happening in the classroom, uh, ensuring that the roles and responsibilities are very, very clear uh, to all actors, uh, including teachers, including mentors, including officials, uh, and of course, ensuring that sort of uh, data also plays a key role. So, so I'll stop here uh, and I'll wait for your, for your question. No, thanks, Aditya. And you know, we'll come back to knowing more about what Haryana and Himachal are doing. But I'll move on to Nishan to you, right? And Prathams, of course, takes a very different approach, which is very much community driven, right? And right now we've been talking about a one is to one sort of device distribution program, which is structured differently by the state. Um, Pratham, of course, operates with the community and more of one is to many model. Would love for you to talk a little bit about what Pratham's approach has been, how it's you know evolved, and um, and really what the sort of the core pillars are um, for the program that that you're running in your communities. Um, it's a very large scale. I think you've distributed about thirty thousand devices um, so far and touched many more lives. So, yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Shubhra, for the question. And thanks for having me here. Uh, what we started out in 2015 was an experiment that we call Prodigy uh, Learning Initiative, short for Pratham Digital. The idea was to try and get technology in the hands of children. Pratham has been involved in digital initiatives since 2005. We have been supporting school systems uh, to implement infrastructure in schools and also add on the learning uh, uh, curriculum which is digital led in the schools itself. But one of the things that we felt is to give more agency to the children, getting to technology in the hands of children is something that we want to do. And that was uh, the thought with which we started out the experiment in 2015. Uh, there were tablets that were preloaded with content. So there was no need of internet as such. The content again was a mixed age, mixed grade content. And rather than going one to one, as you rightly pointed out, we made sure that there is a community ownership. There is a group of children who are accessing this tablet. So we got a group of five children who shared this tablet. 
and the ownership of the tablet was shared between the parents of these children. So this became more of a community device uh, and rather than being my device and uh, my neighbor's device. What we tried to do is learn from the previous initiatives, especially the one laptop per child and hole in the wall. And what we, <clears throat> I'm sorry, what we did, <clears throat> sorry, what we did was moved a step uh, further from, as Aditya rightly pointed out, keeping it to just device distribution and building a program around it. It was important for us that uh, the stakeholders are not limited to just the learner and the teacher, rather the parents play a big role. And that's where we designed infrastructures, uh, which are not as digital infrastructure, but a social infrastructure as well to support the program. <clears throat> we ensured that community members have a role to play. So they were not just custodians and guardians of the tablet. They also had specific role in the learning process. There are committees in the village which uh, organize events to judge various projects that the children are making. They do certificate distribution. The Sarpanch of the village is involved in looking at a monthly report of how the children are progressing. The parents are involved in uh, the learning activity and the youth in the village are playing a big role as coaches so that they uh, get some educational activities for themselves, but also create uh, learning avenues for the younger children. The idea was primarily to <clears throat> make sure that uh, the community has a say and the three uh, pillars of digital infrastructure, social infrastructure and curriculum work together. What we have been able to do is go beyond the school curriculum and focus also on learning for school, learning for life and learning for work. Uh, according to us, in the kind of program that we are doing, uh, this is not mandated uh, or it is not a mandate for the child to do certain courses. We always offer an array of courses and say that you can pick what you want. If you want to pick music for this month as your course, you're free to do that. But if you want to pick music and science, you're free to do that as well. Uh, the idea was primarily self-organized learning, but uh, learning with peers. And for that, the content was designed in a very specific manner where we were not just delivering the concepts, but rather building activities into it. And that's the content repository that we have open sourced. One of the reasons to start this initiative was also the need that we saw of uh, regional language content. Uh, back in the day in 2015, I think after COVID, uh, the numbers have definitely changed. But back in the day, we did not have a lot of uh, easily available content in regional languages. So we started creating content in 12 regional languages. And we made a promise that all of this would be open source for anyone to use. But all of it is activity based learning to make sure that children do something and learn together. And uh, what we have been able to do is uh, scale this model within Pratham. We work with different age groups. Uh, the device in the community is not just a device for a particular age group of learners. That is a device of the community. So the mothers use it. Uh, we have put in recipes uh, for mothers. We have put in uh, other tools that the youth can use. So it becomes more of a device of the community. And hence, we are able to get it uh, uh, used more and more. Sure. This is um, really um, fantastic, Nishan. Thank you so much. And I think it almost talks about how you can create shared value for a, both at a household and a community level through some of these programs. Um, I think, Dayu, coming to you, right, um, and, and almost re requesting you to wear the, uh, a little bit of the m &E hat, um, right? Um, we've heard about various different models and approaches um, right, that states and, and say Pratham is taking, and I'm sure there are several other models that other organizations have taken um, globally as well as in India. I guess from from you and your perspective, right? What is the, almost the data and evidence that you that you see on how successful these models and programs have been in bridging the access gap? Where are the challenges that we're still seeing? Um, you know, so would love to kind of get your thoughts just more from the data and evidence perspective. Um, and then I think the second question that if I can just have you maybe reflect a little bit upon it, uh, the digital divide is not unique to the education sector. Um, and is there anything that the education sector can learn from other sectors, for instance, health or, or, the, or others um, that are also trying uh, you know, different approaches to start for this? Thank you so much, Shubra, and thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I think our speakers already shared so many innovations and important practices, and I think the data largely backs that up. 
So the UNICEF work that we did showed that, you know, a third of the students uh, or more than that in some states don't have access to smartphones. But this reduces to less than 10% who don't have access to any devices, including things like smartphones and TV, right? Um, and so as Mr. Sadath uh, mentioned, we find that access really improves a lot when you use multiple modalities of distribution. So when you include TV, when you include things like uh, feature phones. And so making sure that students who have access to one of these devices get some programming. And I think as Nishant mentioned, the other things that uh, the data really shows effectiveness around is combining digital with community-based interventions. Because of the interactive nature of what you can do in person, if that can be done in, uh, safely with uh, all the COVID protocols and so forth, we've seen that that can really improve reach. Um, an organization in Delhi called Society for All Around Development that we work very closely with, they were able to increase reach by 15 to 20 percent um, when they were uh, sort of augmenting their digital programs with some sort of in-community intervention as well. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, I think what we can learn from uh, other sectors, this idea of digital, um, I think, is just a really important principle. We've seen in the financial inclusion sector, for example, with uh, MFIs, and they're increasingly equipping their banking correspondents with uh, tablets and uh, backend capability so that they can do things like KYC, a lot of that uh, digitally. But they're still going in the communities and actually uh, working with uh, people door to door to build that kind of trust and reach the last mile cu uh, customer. And so the idea of, of combining digital smartly with in-person interactions can really boost reach. Um, and I think the other important uh, uh, piece of data that we've seen is really around the differential impact on different groups of students. I think Mr. Sadath mentioned tribal students really lacking connectivity. Um, we've seen from our study that adolescent girls, for example, um, are 8% less likely to have access to smartphones than adolescent boys. Rural children, 15% less than urban children. And so in all of these programs, we've seen that it's really important to take that diversity and inclusion lens and think about how to reach these students in very different ways, depending on what barriers they may have. Now, for example, for girls, if there are limited devices available in a household, that often goes uh, to boys. And so how might we incentivize um, households to actually provide access to girls as well? Maybe they can couple that with uh, providing subsidized data for uh, students uh, or households who have girl children, for example. And so, um, and, and, the, and the final uh, point that I wanna bring out is the challenge that um, special needs students really face. I think that's a group that's especially difficult to tackle with uh, digital devices. But there's been a lot of innovation and we've seen um, programs, educational content, right, and features that are multi-sensory. So um, having live caption for the audio uh, 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 impaired um, and making sure that there's uh, or visually impaired uh, kids can uh, have sound um, going with it. And so making sure that the programs have uh, various ways to address the challenges that students with disabilities face uh, is, is another important um, finding from our study. And I would say the, um, the final piece I want to bring out is the uh, affordability of data. We've seen that that's really one of the key challenges. Um, addressing the core connectivity issue is important. Device, uh, definitely important. Uh, accessibility of content, important. But what about the cost of data? And there we've seen that actually globally, um, a lot of interesting partnerships with mobile and internet providers to subsidize the cost of data for educational websites. And you can uh, do zero rating essentially list the websites that are educational, hosting educational content and make sure that that uh, fee is waived essentially. And so innovations like that can really, I think, help uh, tackle multiple access barriers along connectivity to device access, to data affordability, to actually accessibility of the content itself. No, thanks, Diane, for bringing it all together so well and almost just talking about how 
the device is just one of the many things that one needs to solve for as we're talking about this digital divide and something that all of the panelists have reflected upon, right? Where it's the device, it's internet, it's the software package and, and a lot of the other things that need to be wrapped around. Um, and this really helps to segue into the next section, right? Where uh, we know a lot of these kinds of programs are very expensive programs, right? And so how do you almost think about the m and and the data that you are getting from these programs so that you know what the program is almost being able to achieve. It's possibly the easiest is to get the device into the hands of, of the people you intend to. It's the usage and it's what what is changing in terms of the for the user in terms of their learning, which is much more harder. And I um, would love to know from all of our panelists um, just a little bit about this. So maybe Mr. Sadat, starting with you, sir, uh, right? Um, you know, as part of the Vidya Shri, what were some of the data points that you know were of interest to you and that have almost guided some of the more subsequent sort of programs that you're rolling out, um, as well as any sort of decisions that you took to course correct the program rollout? Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, after uh, f first of all, no to to just a deviation from the track. Uh, as we all know, I, I think all of us will should, will agree to that that uh, this uh, uh, pandemic and the subsequent closing of schools have affected uh, uh, like anything. So even we tried hard to ensure you no know, at least minimum class access, maybe half an hour or one hour per day to children through various means. It's not through the digital way, but the the gap that was created, especially the mental uh, the issues and all. It's we 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 are not equipped to handle such a pandemic, and uh, even the digital technologies have uh, uh, have not come up to a level of minimizing that gap at least to a, a to a certain level so that is that, that that's a must feel so the school has to reopen and and the physical interaction has to happen so that's one one thing sitting so one you no know, to the this pandemic has made forced the many states or uh, you know governments to come up to a to a sort of solution without doing the uh, background work or uh, without creating the uh, right uh, environment for uh, same thing. Even in Kerala, I know we are fortunate to have to start the digital literacy program in 2003, which was inaugurated by the then President Honorable APG Abdul Kalam Masa, uh, uh, Abdul Kalam. Uh, we have ensured uh, computer literacy on 2003 to 7, at least one person in, it, in, in, in at home. It was started in a district called Malapuram, where I was uh, heading that program, where six lakhs families have been given IT training on in 2005. So this sort of background work is there, and the, the persistent, uh, continuous effort for bringing the digital divide is there. But still, I'm not at all happy for uh, the poor kids which are suffering as of now so we should we should rise to the occasion and uh, uh, you know to do the to do the all uh, the environmental factors in a holistic way so as to face the situation even sure. after the school reopen so that yeah. though it's yes. a long sentence but yes. I have no, thank you so much, sir. And and maybe Nishant, moving to you, right? Our Pratham's always been very strong around data and research, and maybe in terms of the program, right? Uh, just would look to understand from you what are the kinds of data points that Pratham has been, you know, very closely tracking around, um, you know, that community hybrid program, and almost how do you think about how do you get individual level data and usage when you have multiple people using a device? Would just really love some quick thoughts and comments from from you on this. Sure, Shubhra. Uh, data uh, always. Uh, I will divide it into two buckets. One is data for the people who look at data, and data for whom it means action. So uh, if I talk about the first bucket, uh, that would probably be people uh, like us who are running the program. And what data do we want to see? We want to see that the tablets are being used, uh, that there is engagement, and then there is learning outcome. What we do is we divide uh, the engagement part in, uh, into what we want to see uh, a group doing. So rather than looking at individual uh, usage and how many times did an individual use, did the group come together? Uh, once again, 
the concept of digital is very important. So rather than just restricting us to data coming from the device itself, which again we have designed in a manner to collect or to be generated offline and to be collected offline, uh, so that we don't really need internet. But we also look at the data that is being generated of the activities that the children are doing. So the projects they are making, the videos that they are shooting, the photographs that they are making, and how what level of engagement that they have outside the device, because that's equally important. Now that's the data that we like to look at. But talking about the data for people who want to take action. It has to be simple. It has to be easy to communicate, and it has to be a part of the routine. Uh, as Pratham uh, has been doing this for uh, many, many years, uh, something as simple as putting up a board in the village, and uh, when we used to do the learning camps, putting where the children are over a period of a month as we were doing the learning camps tells everyone in the community where their community is, where the children are. Well, we have taken that concept and brought it to a village report card, a digital village report card at that. And that report card is accessible to an individual as to how many skills am I learning to my parents, what, how is my child doing to the group, how is my group doing as compared to the other groups, and to the serpent of the village to say uh, how is your village doing and how are the other villages doing as well. Now, that kind of an ownership on data is something that is very important. Uh, otherwise, I think we do like to look at a lot of data. But to convert it in action, we have to give it to the people who will actually take action on it. No, that's super important, um, Nishant, and a really important point that it's important that the data goes back to the people who, um, you know, the users as well. Dayong, coming to you, right? I mean, designing an m &E for a program like this is always challenging. And maybe from your perspective, uh, you know, what, what would a good m &E for such a program look like? Um, you know, how do you kind of, what are some of the indicators that one should, one one needs to track? Nishant's already and talked about a few of them, but anything else that you might want to add to it? Issues around data reliability for such kind of programs, you, you know, would sort of keeping it a little bit more broad and open for you to respond to. Yeah, thanks, Shibra. Yeah, I think Nishant mentioned uh, all the key principles, I would say, you know, it's pretty comprehensive, not only measuring just the inputs, number of devices in the hands of students, but ensuring that we are tracking outputs, the uh, percentage of kids who are actually using it, the amount of time they're using it, and engagement. Are they actually uh, submitting assignments and doing the homework and so forth? And finally, learning outcomes if possible, right? Um, and I think a key principle that Nishant also mentioned is making sure that these the data that you collect is actionable, um, especially for those who are benefiting from the programs. And I would, I would just add the importance of, again, disaggregated data for a better understanding of which groups of students may be left out or having differential sort of engagement, right? Students with um, special education needs, girl children versus boys. I think as researchers, we often just look at these as a big groups, um, but really understanding what might be the intersectionality across these different groups and which groups may be left out um, because of certain barriers. I think it's important to then influence how the program gets designed again. No, thanks. Thanks, Dayong. And just being mindful of time, we, we have two minutes, but I, I think we can go for another five minutes. So really quickly, maybe just getting some very quick closing um, thoughts from, from all of you in terms of the way forward, right? And, and uh, maybe other just starting with you in, in this section, right? And saying, you know, um, what is in general your experience been about from the kind of demand from governments to introduce a program like this? And what is the role that you think an organization like Samagra and, and you can play um, as part of kind of having more of these programs being designed holistically? Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so. A lot of things actually. So the idea, the idea for these programs is that you know stakeholders across the board have to have a win uh, in this in this program. Right? It's not just about the students, but when it comes to designing and implementing, everybody should uh, have something to look forward to, something that adds value. And so I think this starts with the political leadership. Right? The, uh, what COVID has done is it has sort of increased appetite of the political leadership to engage in such topics and at least uh, uh, be open to the idea that money can be spent here. Uh, what our role is that, you know, we, we, we sort of convert this appetite into, uh, uh, into a program. 
that it manifests on the ground right so the increasing appetite uh, on the particular leadership i think is the first point uh, the second i would say is just helping the bureaucracy design a program for scale uh, where tech uh, and data play a key role uh, that i think becomes the second important point uh, third i would say that because there are so many stakeholders involved especially in a complex ecosystem like education uh, orienting everybody for a common goal for a common vision uh and helping the government do that i think becomes uh, key that everybody is using the same language everybody is shooting for the same outcomes uh, that i think becomes uh, very important and last but not least i would say that we really have to keep at it uh, such programs at scale uh, are sort of long lead items uh, they take a lot of time uh, you know a lot of situations can change at the political level at the bureaucratic level uh, things on the ground so we really have to keep at it <laughs> that 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 i think one of the key things that we bring to the table uh, to be sort of orienting everybody to the same goal uh, getting a win win going uh, and just really being at it no thanks thanks aditya for putting it together so well and maybe nishan very quickly maybe like 30 seconds sort of you know quick thoughts from you right um, pradham's model has been really successful um what do you think would it take for a government to almost adopt and adapt that model and approach right and where do you almost see some challenges or roadblocks in in that happening from your experience right i think uh, we we all talked about the integration of technology and program integration of the device distribution and the programming uh, that definitely is the first thing and the second is uh, community ownership how to bring the community into the fold and uh, uh, not just as a means of uh, increasing ownership of the learning but also as a means of uh, reducing the cost that uh, uh, we are incurring on the outcomes that we want to get to if a device is actually shared by various stakeholders in the community for different uh, learning activities then the overall cost that we are incurring definitely goes down so uh, what what will it take for us to bring in the community trust the community and make sure that they are a part of what we are doing as well fantastic thanks 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 aditya and maybe mr um, mr sadat uh, if you can just maybe reflect on what what nishan has said and even from from your perspective right how do you think about incentivizing governments how do you think governments can be incentivized to make this a priority given budget is also so critical for these programs aditya and nishant have talked about a few things but anything else that you'd like to add from your end um, yeah yeah in fact now uh, right right from 2018 the uh, internet has uh, given us a, a basic rights in kerala uh, through its budget speech and that is why government has launched a program kerala fiber optical network kfon which ensures uh, inter free internet to 2 million families so this has been driven at the level of honorable chief minister itself and the participation of all stakeholders are ensured so uh, the next one you know from the digital education when we go to the online education the gaps within the student out of 38 lakh students 4.7 lakh student have been identified which they need support 50% of students already have the devices and the rest of them can manage either through loan or themselves but uh, 12% 4.7 lakh they need devices for which the government has launched a program called vidya kiranam which is around 1000 crore uh, but it it will be implementing through the community participation so along with the the government budget and Uh, the the it should not be a program of any department that is most important it should not be a program of it or education but there should be a, a common because that is the major head, uh, hurdle in most of the governmental program and the participation of civil uh, the pratham sort of uh, ngos organization civil society it should, uh, could be kept in even the industry industries are very keen so there should be a combined effort to build this to bridge the divide and the plan at here is to build kerala as a knowledge society which is not only for education but basic health health so many advances made though the covid uh, numbers are very high in kerala but uh, uh, the uh, 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 several initiatives in the health sector 
and the livelihood because that is most important as of now. So there should be holistic in intervention and the infra. My my keep one of the last point is that the infrastructure which built uh, or the, the devices which are deployed should not be exclusively for education or health, but it should be for a common with community and intergovernmental association. Uh, this thing. then uh, this uh, opportunity, this uh, uh, pandemic can be taken as an opportunity for our country to leap for, uh, further. No, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Anwarji, for those um, comments. And, and maybe sort of, uh, you know, thoughts from you, Dayong, um, almost in terms of, from an m and &E lens and perspective, what would you say um, in terms of recommendations for governments and CSOs, right, where there is um, almost a need to kind of roll out some of these programs um, very quickly on ground. Any common pitfalls to avoid? Um, you know, would love to get that that perspective from you. Yeah, we talked a lot about access, but that's almost a starting point, right? I think it's important to make sure that that then translates to meaningful engagement and at the end of the day, student learning to bring it full circle. And so, while access is so important, ensuring that there's good uh, focus and, and 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 we're managing for also how that then gets used. Um, I think it's it's really important to remember. And then finally, uh, mistakes are really costly when it's rolled out at large scale. So making sure we're iterating and building and de-risking by building in small experiments. We can very easily figure out what's working and what's not when we're working with 100 households. But when we're working with 300,000 households, that becomes much more difficult to uh, rectify. And so just taking an iterative approach uh, is something else that I emphasize at the end. No, that, no that's, um, that's a really important point to make um, and something that we all need to kind of remember, right? Um, I know we're a little bit out of time. I don't know if there's a question from the audience that we can maybe, um, maybe take. Uh, I'm just, uh, I, I think Ratan has been, okay, maybe what I'll do is I'll just, I think that three, four things that at least have stood out for me as part of this entire conversation. And I know I'm not going to do justice to kind of bringing out all the nuances that, that the four of you've talked about, which are all so critical and relevant as we as we look at bridging this digital divide. Um, but I guess the one, you know, things that we almost need to keep at, the, at our minds, right? Making sure equity is a consideration as we're designing these kinds of programs and models. Um, ensuring the link with with the community, um, as well as possibly even teachers, right? To close the loop in on the learning is 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 sound and and our programs are designed well to take that link into account. Um, and then you know access is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, it's more about getting people to use the device and engage with the device and the sustained usage and that translating into learning outcomes that's going to be critical. And so paying attention to data and what data is saying is going to be important. And in that perspective, Dayung, really borrowing from what you said, right? We, uh, before thinking about scale, we also should think about piloting and iterating and learning um, so that these programs are designed to be successful. Um, it's much harder to roll back an at scale program um, and so maybe avoiding that that pitfall um, that we can potentially find ourselves in. Uh, but um, thank you to all four of you from um, from us at CSF as well as the Nut Foundation and organizers. It's been a really fantastic um, discussion, and I think you all have done brought out some really important aspects of this entire um, entire challenge that we're all grappling with and solving in our own respective ways. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.